Hello everyone. I am Palani Loganathan, CEO, founder and principal consultant of Audio Planet. I'm also privileged to be on DLC's Global Media and Entertainment Committee. Welcome to my DLC talk. I'm privileged to talk about sound and its perception amongst end users. And it's a bit of a payback to the industry which has made me. Talking about sound, many end users in particular think about sound as sound uh, that is derived from specifications of products and what they have read or accumulated data in terms of speakers versus amplifiers. And here I am to outline a few myths and misnomers that may be misleading them and not necessarily guiding them to the goalpost that should it be actually. What I would want to say here is that in search of speakers, amplifiers, or any other audio equipment, we all have a tendency to go by specifications and data that is outlined by the manufacturer themselves. And we don't necessarily know what these yardsticks would mean in each of these data, make or break a particular component over a competitive component. And even if the so-called specification is slightly better than another component, which is competitive, how much of that upgrade in specification is perceptional and worth paying an extra buck. Talking about specifications, some of the specifications that most end users fall upon is the wattage of the speaker. Some of them like to get into a little more important aspects like sensitivity of speakers. Some of them into the materials that have been used for speakers. This is where we want to specify that unless you listen to the speakers and you are able to assign a certain abstract value to the sound signature that is so, so subjective to an individual listener, you are not in a position to accept a so-called global yardstick that has been conveyed by the manufacturer or by the industry specific to a particular material. So all that I'm trying to say is that while the manufacturer is bound to say that a material or an approach used by them is the best and is outdoing competition, it may not necessarily do that for every individual listener. And we would want the end user to go more by hearing is believing rather than the specifications. Talking about hearing is believing, we are going more to perceptions. And fortunately, unfortunately, there are a lot of adjectives used in the industry. Some of them tend to call a sound neutral, warm, bright, forward, laggard, and many, many other words, uh, soothing maybe. But then each word to each individual is so specific and may not match the expectations of somebody else. And more often than not, there is a unfortunate comparison yardstick that is happening where people end up rating a speaker or an amplifier better based on the content that they listen to. So this is like a crude analogy if I were to give you. If the world's second best camera was limited only to capturing the images of a beautiful rose in multiple colors with probably dew drops and a lot of other things on it. But the world's best camera was further limited only to capture images of cockroaches. How many people would have the technical yardstick to say that the first camera is actually a better camera over the second camera because they are only getting to see cockroaches over roses. So what I'm humbly saying is that there are chances that you will be driven by the content that was played on a speaker or an amplifier. You will have to draw a line between liking content versus evaluating the speaker itself or the amplifier itself for his performance well beyond the content or the liking for the content itself. Coming back to data and specifications related to speakers, particularly mentioned by the manufacturers, we would want to kind of mention that there could be a, a, a significant difference of variation in the modalities of capturing data itself. Uh, it is proven that the anechoic chambers in which speaker specifications or amplifier specifications are captured itself have a sufficient degree of variation between one anechoic chamber to another anechoic chamber. With due respect 
to data and specifications, what according to me is more important is to measure sound from what I call as real sound. So how do you get the perspective of real sound? You need to have certain yardsticks of how a certain instrument sounds in real, or maybe how somebody whom you have listened to in real actually sounds, and play the same sound on a speaker amplifier to see how relatively close the speaker or the amplifier is to the original sound to which you have a concrete yardstick. So without knowing these yardsticks, if you get into measuring sound with specifications, there's more chances of going wrong. And with the content being yardstick to what is real and what you have heard, the chances of you going wrong is not so high. Here again, we get to a situation where, let's say a particular end listener is evaluating five brands. And out of the five brands, let's again say two brands are not being liked by him and he is liking only the last three brands. And out of the last three brands, he is rating a brand as the most liked number one brand and maybe the number two and number three as the second most liked and the third most liked brand. So when he is rating the brands like this on so-called likability of a particular brand and a speaker or an amplifier, it is important for an exhibitor like us to kindly take him to the real yardsticks of how the speaker should have been. There is a possibility of somebody growing up with a liking for more bass, and any speaker which gives a little more bass than any other speaker is going to be rated by him as a better speaker. But if that heavier bass was not to be the sound signature for a particular track, and it is only because of this guy's inherent liking for bass, he is actually picking a speaker, it is the duty of an exhibitor to kind of tell the end user that this particular component has a little more base than required. It is a deviation from the normal yardstick. But if you are still liking it, please go ahead. So that gives the customer, uh, end user, a better perspective of how to rate. And on this newfound knowledge, if he is re-evaluating the speaker and is coming up with his rating list of number one, number two, and number three speaker, and if the exhibitor were to ask him between the best, second best, and the third best speaker that you have rated, on a scale of zero to 10, how would you rate them? And let's say that this guy says the best speaker is nine out of 10, the second at eight out of 10, and the third is seven out of 10. So with an upgrade from seven to eight and from eight to nine, as we are moving up the speaker line, what is the price that the end user would have paid to justify that so-called upgrade is the most crucial aspect. Will you pay X is to 2X price on an upgrade when you are moving from a 7 out of 10 to 8 out of 10 speaker? Or will you again do the same from moving from a 8 out of 10 to 9 out of 10 speaker is the most crucial. Depending on how good your pocket is and how much you are liking sound and you could afford it, some people may say to move from 7 out of 10 to 8 out of 10 from one equipment to the other equipment, I think I may pay not more than 15-20%. So be it, it should be respected. Anything more on the price may not be a value proposition for that particular upgrade. Another important aspect of product evaluation and comparison is time frames used for the comparison and evaluation. Would you be comfortable evaluating a particular component on one weekend and so-called assimilating the sound signature values which are so abstract. I told you sound can be perceived as warm, bright, forward sounding, easy, retarded, what not, okay? So with a so-called memory of uh, abstract sound signature in mind, would you be comfortable going into another product comparison the next weekend and how much can you claim as having memory in terms of comparison? We have found with due respect customers sometimes lack memory for even extending one comparison into the another comparison for more than 10 minutes. How have we found that? We have played, let's say, speaker A, B, C, D uh, in a span of around 40 minutes with a 10-10 minute gap and a particular end user group, not just an end user. End user group comes up with a certain preference of one brand over the other and they rate the sequence in which they have liked the brands. And the next time around, we just play them at a shorter time frame, getting the sound signatures closer to each other and not giving them so much time. I have seen many, many times that the preferences change completely. And when we do real-time tests with, let's say, all other constants, so if I'm evaluating a speaker, we have to keep amplifier, sound pressure level, acoustic, seating position, and anything else related to the sound signature constant, and the only variable being the speaker. And the closer we play the four variants and get them 
to play almost real time the customer's rating and preferences completely change from the initial evaluation where they were asked to evaluate with a 10 minute time gap between each sound listening sessions now if this can happen in a span of 40 minutes and this is over my 22 year experience that i'm saying with absolute respect to the customers, with all their passion and energy, where they go for listening, evaluating sound components, one weekend in one showroom, go to another uh, showroom or another evaluating place on another weekend, with so many other variables like changing acoustics, changing related equipments, sometimes changing content itself. And again, you are not in a position to keep the volume the same between experience one and experience two when it is at two different places. How much of your your perception is impacted by the other variables, including volume, related equipment, better acoustics versus not so better acoustics in one of the environments is a big, big question. So with due respect to products, their claims, and whatever is there as data on their specification sheet, we say that when listening and evaluation has to happen real time, it is better it happens in a very short time frame on one single content rather than playing diverse content and getting confused, retain very high memory of the content that has been played on one speaker or one amplifier or any other audio equipment and relate the same thing to three or four other competitors in a shorter time span and get the best possible value in terms of you rating the speakers best versus obviously the price evaluation that I shared with you earlier. Having gone for the most preferred sound signature, whatever you may call the sound signature, it is upon the customer to get the best out of the product already chosen in his listening environment. Remember, he has evaluated a product in the evaluators or the exhibitors environment where acoustics could have been pristine and you are not in a position to actually replicate the same acoustics. The value that you have actually paid for the product may not get reflected in your listening environment and it doesn't make sense to have put so much of time, effort and money into the product by evaluating a product at the exhibitor's environment which you are not in a position to replicate. So what does it boil down to? Acoustics, positions of the prime listener relative to the speakers. If it is speakers in stereo mode, music listening, we say that it is best for the speaker li listener to form a 60 degree angle with both the speakers at its very best or at least a 45 degree angle to get what is best sound staging. Now, if you have evaluated a speaker for its better sound staging and you are not in a position to put the speakers in its best position and you go to the relative seating position, then why did you pay that money for its speaker's capability to give you that kind of sound staging? You are missing out. Similarly, there are many other aspects like I told you in acoustics, there are certain areas where if the sound reflects of the boundary walls, you get into a phenomenon called standing waves and extra bass than what is required. You could also get into null points of the standing waves where you absolutely have no bass at all. If you have liked a particular speaker for a particular bass note, but if you are sitting in a null point in your room, which was not the case when you evaluated at the listener's environment, then the very reason that you have bought the speaker or the amplifier is not being justified because you're not getting the best out of the speaker amplifier. So it is so, so important to understand the science of sound from the integrational aspects and get the entire solution comprehensively rather than limit the experience only to brand capability or brand claim. To sum it up, I would say uh, end user is better off evaluating a product more on terms like yardsticks based to real sound rather than just specifications. Specifications can definitely be an uh, additional tool to list the speaker, shortlist the speaker, and the final evaluation should happen on better yardsticks. And most importantly, uh, end user should keep in mind that a product is just half of the journey and the remaining half and the comprehension that comes from is from the integrational science that has associated with the product and only a product and proper integration will sum up the entire experience for you in your listening environment for the money and the effort that has been put into the product. To end with an analogy, I would say a great product is just a beautiful bird with great feathers and no wings and it is only along with proper integrational aspects that this bird develops its wings and starts soaring into the size. I would like to end 
thanking DLC profoundly for this opportunity to share my knowledge and hope it has been insightful, hope it has been helpful. Thank you so much all for the patient listening.